Welcome to The Safe Village, a community for everyone who cares about student safety and well-being. My name is Sydney. I'm the CEO of Sassian, and my guest today is Daisy Turnbull. Daisy is the Director of Wellbeing at St. Catherine's School in Sydney. She's the author of 50 Risks to Take with Your Kids. She's a mother of two. She's a columnist on Sydney Morning Herald. Daisy, welcome to The Safe Village. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. So I think we've got a lot of things to cover and we'll get through them hopefully in this short space of time. But I always like to start with Daisy, what's top of mind? For me, what's top of mind right now, obviously most of um, uh, New South Wales and Victoria is in a lockdown again. And for me, what's top of mind because of that is student mental health. And I think, you know, we need to keep everyone safe and lockdowns make sense. But I think that we still don't know what the impact is going to be on teenagers. And I wrote about that last week in the Sydney Morning Herald, but we have, you know, there's data coming out uh, from Europe about kids having increased rates of depression, increased rates of self-harm. And I must say the thing that I was really amazed by was after my article on Sunday, a lot of parents uh, messaging me that, you know, some I knew, some I didn't, just saying how um, they have noticed these mental health um you know, challenges in their kids as a result of, of lockdown. And I think that um, we are facing a, a very interesting period where kids and teenagers have been staying at home and, and losing out on experiences and socialisation to keep uh, the vulnerable in society safe. But I don't know if we're actually turning our minds to how to remedy that. That's really interesting. So I got to think about that as well after I read that article on the weekend and I thought, yeah, like, uh, you know, I've got this happy-go-lucky attitude around the house, but, uh, you know, I've got three kids and I haven't actually quite asked the question, well, there's a whole bunch of things you're missing out on. Like my daughter, she's turning 16 this year. She would have had her school formal not happening. Last year's school camp got cancelled because of last year's COVID (laughs) and there was a concert first week back that, again, got cancelled, let alone her Duke of Edinburgh hike. So uh, yeah. when you think about the impact of all of that, and I've checked in with her uh, after that, I go, how are your friends doing? And, you know, how are you doing? And, and so that was a good wake up call for me. But this is, um, you know, this is the forum for all parents to have a bit of a wake up call and a little bit of a tip or a trick on the questions we should be asking. So that was a great article, hit the, hit the nail on the head. And I think, you know, I think that, that, that question to ask is a really simple one. It's just to say, you know, what what do you feel you have missed out on and and how can I help with that? Mm. And I think it's about giving kids the opportunity to say, this is what I'm missing. And, and, you know, and I think last time when we were in lockdown, we were very, you know, this will pass, this will be fine. It's just a short amount of time. But this time there's so many great articles that talk about the amount of fatigue that is happening because of lockdown. And I think that everyone is fatigued and it means the parents might not want to, dive into those big conversations, but it's almost even more of a reason to do so. Yes, yes, certainly. And um, in line with your role at St Catherine's being the wellbeing director, um, what are some of the initiatives you guys are uh, doing to support them at schools? Because I know that we've got a lot of uh, schools and, uh, you know, wellbeing leaders and principals listening into the Safe Village content. So this will be some good insights for them. Yeah, look, so generally when we're on site, we have a wellbeing program that's based in, you know, what you would traditionally think of a homeroom or, you know, your house group for that year. So you're with the same girls and and you're talking to them about issues. We have tied our wellbeing program to the school values of integrity, resilience, respect, relationships and service. And we feed that through year seven to 12. So year seven is really focused on integrity. It's knowing who you are, your character strengths. Um, resilience really comes in in year eight when we talk about, you know, obviously tough times in life, but also that concept of a growth mindset. In year nine, we focus on um, respect and relationships in year 10 as well. And then we focus on service. And then year 11 and 12 is really the time where we're cementing that knowledge and showing them how applicable it is when they finish school. Because You know, what we're seeing in the media is people are talking about resilience now in a way they never were a few years ago. And schools that uh, promote well-being and positive psychology programs, they are raising their, um, their, their educating students in a language that is important for when they get into the workforce. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, as we keep, as you know, as we keep pursuing the, the mission here with the Safe Village, as I keep bringing on guests, I keep thinking, wow, if only this stuff was available in our days, right? <laughs> We've had to learn it late in, you know, in our, you know, adulthood and professional careers. And you still see corporates struggling with this in terms of that kind of positive language that you talk about. Yeah. So um, speaking of the structure and the approach, like you would have seen a lot of, um, there would have been a lot of lessons and insights and perspectives. And I think um, one of the themes we spoke about on the pre-call on this was around autonomy. Do you want to have a uh, talk a little bit about your perspective on that and, and uh, what are the considerations for students and for schools? So I'm really passionate about autonomy. Um, I'm really passionate. Ryan, uh, Richard Ryan and Edward DC have a uh, theory called self-determination theory. And it's around how we become motivated. And they talk about the three parts you need for that. So one is um, autonomy. So, you know, you need to be able to choose what you're doing. The other is competence. Like you, you need to be slightly challenged, you know, one or two step challenges. And the third is relationship. So you need to be connected to the people who are who you're learning with. And that's, that's important any time in life, you know. And we know that the biggest factor that influences a student's learning is the relationship they have with their teacher and having that positive relationship and that safe relationship. Um, we know that students do well when they feel they're getting that sense of achievement. But I also think autonomy is interesting because um, obviously there's not a huge amount of autonomy uh, in schools because you have a curriculum, you have to do the curriculum. But we see students who may have been really disengaged in the earlier years in a subject that no longer have to do that subject for the HSC. And when they get control of the subjects they get to study, we see them become more engaged. I think autonomy is also really important younger for younger kids as well, obviously beyond the curriculum. So um, that idea of letting kids make decisions whereas feel, versus feeling like they're always having decisions decisions made for them and understanding consequences of I think is, is an important one to do so that could be you know if you are the parent of a young kid it could be like letting your kids dress themselves in the morning and yeah they're going to be wearing weird outfits but they've chosen that outfit um and then sometimes saying actually no tonight we're seeing you know Aunt Beryl and you have to wear the jumper she knitted you you know suck it up that's what you're wearing um and I think that it's it's about giving them that option of autonomy and and that feeds into the idea of them learning to trust their own gut and, and understanding how they feel about situations. And I think that that feeds into a lot of issues. But, you know, one of the things I'm really passionate about is we need to let kids um, take risks, obviously, because that's what my book's about. But we need to let kids learn how to judge how they feel in a situation when they're younger so that when they are in dangerous situations, they can actually recognise it because that's what a lot of data is showing us and a lot of, you know, anecdotal information as well around um, the consent crisis that came up earlier in the year is a lot of girls will say, you know, he was my best friend, I always felt safe around him or I didn't realise, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that what's interesting there is when we haven't necessarily given kids and young teenagers that op that opportunity to kind of figure out how they feel in a situation, they may not know what to do as well. Mm, mm, mm. Um, well, great segue, uh, speaking of <laughs> these things, into your book, 50 Risks to Take with Your Kids. I think you've got a copy there. Can you hold it up? Yeah. Oh, wait, ah. I'm going to come to you. Hold it up again. <laughs> oh, yeah, hang on. Oh, wow, you can control things. Uh, I always stuff up with Zoom because of the... Uh, reflection perfect so we've got it uh i actually went and bought a copy knowing that i'm interviewing you and, I, and i've got it in my city office and so i'm now stuck at home and i didn't actually get it so I get there. There, I you go. Buy another one. Uh, there you go well, well well that's all good so um tell me how the book came about what inspired you to write this book and uh you i covered a little bit of the premise of it but uh, tell us more about the book yeah, so look, one of the things I deal with at school all the time is learning about the research and the journal articles about positive psychology and developing resilience in students. And I find it really interesting and I turn them into activities we can do with students. But what I felt was that while there's all this data and like evidence up here, there's not necessarily the how-to for parents. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to come up with a list of things your kids can do that help them develop resilience and independence and, you know, grit and growth mindsets and all of that and just become good humans. Um, 
And that's really what inspired it. And it started as a joke with a friend of mine who I was working with on another project who was an editor. And I said, you know, we need a list of like 100 things to do before you become an adult, including, you know, sitting on hold to Telstra and that kind of thing. And then she said, actually, this is a great idea for a book. And so we cut it in half. So 50 Risks is up to the age of 10. And we're just, I'm just finishing off um, 50 questions to ask your teenager, which is from kind of 11 or 12 up. So that was that was the idea. And uh, and I think, you know, 50 Risks to Take with Your Kids started as the joke title and then it stuck. Well, I think it, it, it's certainly a, um, a, a great title and I think um, it comes back to what we were saying before. If only we uh, were taught some of these things earlier on. And we say parenting doesn't come with a, um, a how-to guide or a manual, right? Like you all of a sudden they're here and, and you're responsible and then, and of course, context always changes anyway. So something that worked in uh, our parents' generation uh, days doesn't now work for us as uh, parents. And of course, our kids will say we're out- outdated and old fashioned and I've already got one of my kids calling me pops. So there you go. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's right. Um, but I think it, the opposite is also true. Like I think there are so many manuals, so many books, and parents can get freaked out. And I think that that um, you know oversupply of information can make parents even more risk averse. And instead, it's about parents understanding what their kid is able to do and and working with that rather than thinking of everything that can go wrong. Love it. I mean, as an entrepreneur, I've embraced failure all, all my life and just part of them parcel. And now even with the Sassian team, we just say, you know, we're going to make some mistakes and learn from it and let's not freak out. And as long as we've got the right values and we learn from things, then I think um, that's the same thing that I'm trying to apply to parenting. But anyway, I want to get deeper into your book uh, when, when, when I get the chance. And uh, congratulations for getting that out and also working on the next one, 50 Questions. Yeah. It's funny, um, there was actually an article, I can't remember, I'll find it, but it says that kids, uh, like teenagers now in their 20s, are less entrepreneurial than they were because they haven't necessarily taken those risks and had those failures and they don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah, no, and and you see that. And I think... um... So not only are they, uh, from, again, entrepreneur perspective, I don't have my qualifications like you do as a psychologist, but just Hmm. observing people's... I'm not a psychologist, not a psychologist, teacher, sorry. We've we've made that clear. (laughs) (laughs) Got it. Um, So, but, so, okay, I'm also trying to say I don't have the qualifications, but it's an observation that also the kids that came from uh, parent environments where they didn't have to struggle, they've even got lower self-esteem in some cases and, and, and because they, you know, uh, so the self-worth because they almost never had to go gain uh, something or try to achieve something, right? It, it's just much harder. So I think yeah. um, struggle and some uh, pushback in life is, is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Cool. I want to switch topics now, Daisy, and talk about um, given the role that you have in schools, it's very important, the well-being function. Um, If there's another emerging Daisy, so a Daisy five years behind you, looking to become a well-being um, counsellor to then become eventually in your role director, what guidance would you have for them and or for schools who are looking to more formally implement a well-being function? Mm. Um, You know, I feel like the pandemic and, um, and even before, a little bit before that, when we were seeing the effects of the bushfires on communities and, and, and throughout Australia, led to a lot of people who had maybe rolled their eyes at, at well-being and, and mental health and gratitude and stuff kind of go, okay, actually, this is important. How do we do this? So um, in that sense, 2020 has been, um, you know, an opportunity for a lot of people to, to wonder about well-being and, and look into it and recognise things like burnout and fatigue and and all of these things that I feel like I was, I've been a little bit like, um, you know, the chicken running around saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and now people are actually starting to see it. Um, so I would say that if you were um, thinking of starting wellbeing now, now is a great time to do it because you don't have people saying things to you like, oh, it's soft skills or it's not in an exam you know like I wrote a piece last year um about how Josh Frydenberg mocked Jim Chalmers for talking about how the how New Zealand has a well-being budget and he was making jokes about aligning chakras and that kind of thing and and that now you know his position on that has aged terribly because we all know what the mental health impact 
of um of isolation is so so that's the first thing i'd say is i'd say it is a much better time in a way to be getting into this conversation because everyone is taking it a lot more seriously everyone has experienced decreases in their mental health even if it's even if you have been very safe even if you are the biggest introvert who loves staying at home being forced to stay at home is very different to choosing to stay at home Mm -hmm. um and to that point, the argument for um, what protects our well-being is 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 just as um, important, but even easier to understand. We know that relationships are at the heart of our well-being. So there's the Harvard Longitudinal Study that shows that um, strong relationships are the basis of, um, you know, life satisfaction or happiness. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have 50,000 followers it's, and, and it's not even necessarily in a marriage. It's about having good quality relationships in your life. And, um, and we know that and I think we've all experienced that. Um, I think the other thing I would say is every school and every community is different. So when I started in the role at St Catharines, we, had, we were using a, a program that was kind of created that was created by Professor Martin Seligman who started positive psychology and we basically use all of the same information but we've structured it around our school values so I would say don't go and find an off-the-shelf program look at creating one yourself and and the biggest thing this is the last thing I say sorry I'm ranting the biggest thing is delivery and you cannot deliver well-being programs if the people delivering them don't believe it that wasn't around. That was perfect. Um, then let's sort of tie into my next question, which is going from the, uh, as you claimed, the, uh, the headless chicken saying the sky's falling to the courage in writing a book and getting the message out and contributing to our national papers and things like that. To where you are now, what is it about your mission and the role that you've got daily? Uh, and your role is broad, right? Author, mum of two. <laughs> Uh, um, I would say that I uh, I do too much stuff. Um, uh, I think the I think that my my passion for well being has come from experiencing loved ones having poor mental health at times. So I've seen the need for preventative measures, um, and then. I think that has led and that's kind of what got me into well-being in general at school. But it also I'm a lifeline crisis supporter as a volunteer, so that's part of my um, experience as well. I think that um, and I think, you know, I often talk about how being a well-being teacher and having young kids means that I'm doing everything at double time. Like, I'm like, oh, I read about this at school. I'll try that out with the kids or the kids did this. So I'll try that out at school. So I felt like I was always kind of double checking my strategies to see if it worked. Um, and, you know, the writing, the look, I, I will never lie. I am incredibly privileged and I've come from a family where um, I have, you know, a, a lot of connections that a lot of people wouldn't have. So that, that has been a huge reason as to why I've been able to um, do what I've done. But um but I think I've always loved words. I've always been a nerdy reader and I've always, um, and I, you know, I, I fought with my dad so much when I was a teenager because he used to say, stop writing in gobbledygook, just write the way you speak. And I used to think, I can't write the way I speak. I'm a 14-year-old girl. Nobody wants to listen to a 14-year-old girl. And I think I maintained that until, you know, I started working on the book and people said, this is good. So I would say if you are someone who likes communicating, write the way you speak. And, um, and you know, writing... Um, writing for the paper is, is something that, you know, I was asked to do a few months ago and I just, I love it. So I, I haven't had a, a, a month yet where I've had nothing to write about. The topics have all been pretty relevant. <laughs> so I, I keep doing it and, um, and maybe one day I'll, I'll be asked not to anymore. And, and I think this is just a stage of my life. Oh, I think we're a long way away from uh, that time happening. So, uh, but my, my follow up to that question, it's my final question is, what is it then you wish that people knew about your mission and your work that they don't know? So even still with having all these things that put you in an advantage and you've got the head start, what are the challenges today? And what is it that you wish people knew about your work and the mission so that if they knew and hopefully this platform becomes a small part of, you know, your overall thing that, that they can hear about, what is it that would make your life easier? I think um, for anyone talking about or looking into mental health and, um, and well-being, 
it's just how important conversations are. And I think it's so easy to get stuck in like texting conversations and it's so much better to pick up the phone. It's so much better to go for a walk with a friend, even, you know, during lockdown, go for a walk with a friend rather than just going back and forth on text, especially for teenagers. So I think conversations are at the heart of all of this. And um, yeah, and I, you know, I think that's, that's, that's the biggest lesson. The other thing I would say for anyone who is talking to teenagers right now, and, and that's, you know, that's a lot more, a lot more people than there were before because all the parents are doing it as well as teachers now. Um, you know, I often see memes and they're like, oh, this is what I learned at school, maths and English. What I didn't learn was self-regulation and self went, you know, and there's that. We didn't do that stuff when I was at school as well as we could have. But what I would say is that um, we are doing it now, but that doesn't necessarily mean students are listening to everything we're saying. No student listens to everything you say. And a lot of students will roll their eyes at gratitude activities and that kind of thing, but they are learning from it. They are benefiting from it. And I would say just keep persevering and keep trying to find ways that, that you can get to them and break through and, and get them seeing the benefits of it. And, and I know this year at St. Cath's and last year, the students really did see the benefit in what we were doing. Fantastic. I've taken away a lot from this uh, interview. Let me see if I can sum up uh, the key highlights for me. So yeah. the one that was most practical and, and a reminder again, stemming from your article, but then you sort of added another little nuance in today's session is ask your kids, um, how do you feel um, about what you've missed out and how can I help? Simple question opens up dialogue and it's consistent with what you're saying, the conversation and the relationship, right? Being, mm -hmm. being uh, stemming from that. Let's recognize that um, everyone's fatigued in this uh, situation. So I think um, we're all being kinder, but we can always remember that, as you said, even the most introverted person who loves being uh, quietly sitting at home, they want to feel like they have the option to get out and we're not having uh, that opportunity right now. Um, one of the uh, takeaways about how you've implemented well-being at your school is you've taken some, you know, world-class thinking, but then you've adopted it to what works for the school and your approach was to align it to the school values. Um, and uh, certainly I encourage everyone to go and check out your book, 50 Risks to Take with Your Kids, all the things that we're want, trying to help with our kids around resilience and independence and growth mindset. You've got a ton of examples. And from today's session, we can see very practical and down to earth. Um, now, in terms of people thinking about getting into the space, uh, you said um, now's the best time. It's a great time because uh, it's top of mind. It's no longer one of those things that people roll their eyes on about, you know, well-being and mental and emotional wellness. Um, and if um, even the most safe people have experienced some decrease in their well-being, relationships matter. Recognize every school is different. And the final thing was delivery is important. And yeah. so persevere um, because you will get some pushback at the beginning from the students, from parents, from community, but it's important and persevere. How's that for a summary? That was amazing. <laughs> there I you go. I was listening. The was, there anything, was there anything I should have asked that I haven't asked that you wanted to cover? No, it was awesome. Thank you. Fantastic. Daisy Turnbull, thank you for being on The Safe Village and I wish you all the best. Thank you.